Hi, my name is Don Reed. I'm a general practitioner and co-creator of BiteFX software, and thank you for downloading this trial copy of BiteFX. I developed BiteFX software after studying with doctors Peter Dawson, Frank Spear, Terry Tanaka, Jeff Okeson, and many others that helped me understand the importance of occlusion in general practice. What the software has allowed me to do is get case acceptance on areas where patients have been previously undiagnosed. This morning I'd like to give you a quick recipe for success and show you how to get started with bite effects in the area of splint presentation. So let's get started. When you install bite effects, this is the screen you'll see. Uh, it consists of animations. There are 60 animations. We'll be producing about one animation a month. Uh, based on our uh, customers' uh, desires to have new animations related to occlusion, and it consists of a series of photographs. So the photographs are reached by pushing this uh, picture panel, and the animations are reached by clicking right here. So you have animations and pictures. Let's go back to the animations. So I'm going to create a sequence that um, I use routinely to get acceptance with uh, splint therapy. Uh, one of the problems uh, I found with treating occlusion disease is it's a difficult concept to explain, but it's a very predominant disease that affects the majority of my patients. Uh, I see problems with tooth wear, I see problems with uh, hyperactive muscles and headaches, uh, teeth breaking, uh, teeth that are sensitive, and even bone destruction. So all of these animations will allow you to address those uh, concerns as you see them. And some of the problems with occlusion disease consist that they are signs and not symptoms. So there are things that we see, like excess wear, for example, and the teeth don't hurt yet. Uh, so they don't have symptoms, but they do have signs. So we've created animations that allow you to uh, to take those signs and help people understand that the implications are if these signs are just allowed to progress untreated that they'll often turn into symptoms. It's much easier when you have uh, symptoms. So let's say you have a patient that has temporal headaches, um, tight muscles, they feel like their bite doesn't feel right and they wake up with headaches and you find out that the headaches are in the temporal, temporal region. So the, this sequence will allow you um, to very effectively uh, get case acceptance. I'm going to go through the um, simplicity of using bite effects and just familiarize you with the, um, the buttons that are um, important to get started. So as I said, you have pictures and you have animations. So this particular sequence is going to involve several animations, which I'm just going to simply grab and drag and it's going to go down here to where it says new sequence. So I'll double click here and we'll call this uh, splints. And I'm going to use this particular animation and I'll add a photograph to that that I find effective. It shows normal opening. And I'll go back to my animations and show tooth contacts, what ideal tooth contact looks like, canine guidance, anterior guidance and protrusion, and I want to show a picture uh, of canine guidance, what it looks like clinically, so I'll go back to my pictures, and under canine guidance, I'll get this one here, cuspid rise, Pull that down, put it right behind canine guidance. With anterior guidance, I'm going to add a picture there to show someone biting in their natural bite and sliding into protrusion. Go back to my animations. And I'll show the muscles in a stable bite, how they function. And now I'm going to grab an animation that shows a destructive occlusion. Grab 
like this. Show this one with Bruxing. Show the different jaw positions that we see where someone's in a habitual bite and in a centric relation bite position. Back to my animations. One of my favorites is when there's no canine guidance. Another favorite is a destructive occlusion animation. Go back to my photos and show what it looks like clinically when there's no canine guidance in a destructive occlusion. And, it, and then I'll grab this photo that shows an occlusal view of that same arch with no canine guidance. Go back to my animations by clicking this button. And this animation shows the muscle activity in a destructive occlusion. This is a comparison of a stable and destructive occlusion musculature. What the splint does, the details of the splint. And let's end with a happy, satisfied patient. So along with this video, you will have received a detailed instructions on how to in create the same sequence in your own practice. Uh, I'm going to show you a feature that allows you to record this session. And before I go through uh, some of the uh, things that I discuss, discuss with patients in this particular um, sequence called splints, simply come up here to this red button, select it, it gives you a name, and we'll call this Bill Jones. And hit OK. And now we're going to be recording the um, sequence when I open it up. So to start the sequence, you would open up Bite Effects. You would see this splints sequence down here and select the first animation. And this is all recording. Um, and this can be sent to a patient uh, so they can have more detailed information if they'd like it or want to discuss it with a uh, family member. And also this can be put into their uh, file um, in any um, computer system that you're using. So I'm just going to discuss with you uh, dentist to dentist about some of the things that I would bring up uh, with my patients and um, some of the things I found effective. Um, primarily I feel that um, this is the first time they've sat down with the dentist eye to eye and he's talked or she has talked specifically about solving problems that are related to a destructive bite. Personally I found that when I stopped um, treating just tooth disease and gum disease and added treating the uh, whole gamut of occlusal disease in my practice, um, productivity went up. So let's begin. Uh, down here there's a, a cursor that you grab and allows you to move the animation and you don't have to maintain the arrow on the cursor. You can be anywhere on the screen. And what I'll show the patient is that there's a jaw joint position where this bone, the condyle, fits all the way up in this bony socket against a piece of cartilage. I tell them this cartilage is made of a different material than all the other joints in their body. It's a very unique and complex joint. It's made of fibrocartilage, which is similar to shoe leather. All the other cartilage in their body is made of hyaline, which is a kind of a softer material. I just say it's more like abalone. And I'll show them that there's a position where the jaw joint can't go up any further. We depict it here on bite effects with green lines lining up. And I'll say that in a stable bite or a healthy bite, all the teeth contact simultaneously with equal pressure and this joint is seated. 
and I'll also show them that uh, for about one inch of opening the jaw just rotates in the socket and during the second inch of opening it actually comes out of socket often I'll find them sitting there in the chair next to me and opening their jaw wide and show them that with a stable bite the jaw joint goes all the way up as far as it can go against that cartilage and they come back into their existing or habitual bite. I tell them that normal opening is um, wide enough that if you were to take your right hand and turn it sideways and can get your index finger, middle finger, and fourth finger between the biting edges of your teeth uh, comfortably that would be considered a normal healthy range of motion. I like to discuss tooth contacts and I show them that when the jaw comes together and the joint seated that the back teeth touch simultaneously with the front teeth and I'll go back and forth and let them look at that again. Back teeth touch simultaneously with the front teeth and there's little dots of contact in the back and lines in the front. Living in a ski area I equate um, this to Squaw Peak and this to Alpine and this to the uh, down in the valley where you have your uh, wine after a hard day of skiing and these would be the ski slopes and I tell them that uh, there should be no contact on these slopes but just on the top where the gondola is and down here where you uh, spend your afternoon after a hard day of skiing. They relate to that in Lake Tahoe. Another animation and important element in a stable bite is canine guidance and I show them that if they were to move their jaw sideways uh, either when they're awake or when they're asleep that the only teeth that should touch would be the canines and all the back teeth would come apart simultaneously. There'd be no contact on any back teeth. Often run that back and forth. These are the um, forward backward ar arrows to take you through the sequence. They just go to next animation and I show them what this looks like clinically. This could be a picture of their own teeth or you could use one of the stock photos in bite effects. I show them protrusion and again I'll emphasize the joint is seated. All the teeth hit simultaneously with equal pressure. You slide forward and the front teeth come together edge to edge and all the back teeth instantly come apart. And I'll show a photo of what that looks like as someone slides from their habitual bite into a protrusion. At this point I'll often tell them that there's a, there's a study, and you can go backwards, there's a study that, show, that says, it's the Williamson study, it says if any back teeth can touch when you move either sideways or forward in your sleep, that muscle activity is greatly increased. And we'll just flip forward again in the animation. This is a favorite. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to give them uh, some scientific um, information about musculature. And I tell them there's a normal muscle function. And if we're dealing with a headache patient, as you know and I know, um, they may be skeptical if you tell them that their headaches are related to their bite. I found, um, and if you tell them that you need an appliance to fix their headaches, uh, they might often look at you and look at you with a cross-eyed or blank stare and uh, just say, well, maybe I can just go down to Kmart and get a mouth guard. And the bite effects, uh, this bite effects sequence will show you why uh, a particular splint that you would fabricate has all the elements of a, a stable bite and a perfect bite and why they would need this type of appliance rather than just any appliance or anything they would buy online or uh, or worse to put a mouth guard in there, a uh, sports guard. So here I start by telling them that there are muscles that open the mouth and muscles that close the mouth and here we show the muscles that open the mouth and I say there's a muscle that goes from your chin down to somewhere near your Adam's apple pulls the chin down and lets you start to open. They know by now the jaw comes out of socket and I tell them there's another small set of muscles. I like to call them pterygoid muscles and uh, I tell them this is a digastric muscle and um, 
these muscles will contract to pull the jaw out of socket. So often I'll back up and let the joint go back into its utmost seated position and show them how the muscles pull the chin down and pull the jaw out of socket. At that point I tell them these are the only two muscles, this pterygoid muscle and this digastric muscle, these are the only two muscles that should be contracting as you open wide. And then during closure, the muscles that close the mouth, which are these masseters, which are often sore, or these are sore, and this is the source of head pain, um, are the only muscles that should function when you close your mouth, and that these muscles will release and relax. So this shows them the uh, reciprocal nature of the muscles of opening and closing. So we go back here and I'll grab this cursor and start to close the mouth. And as they close the mouth, I say watch how the muscles that open your mouth relax, especially down under your chin, and then the muscles uh, that shut the mouth begin to fire. Those are in the big red ones. And I tell them when the joint is fully seated here, that these muscles will be completely relaxed. Frank Spear has a definition of centric relation that I particularly like, and he says that centric relation is where the jaw joint goes when you bite and the pterygoid muscles are completely relaxed. So as we close the mouth, the joint seats, they come back into their habitual bite, and now these muscles are completely relaxed. And the only muscles that are firing during clenching and a healthy stable bite would be the masseters and the pterygoids, and these are completely shut off. Often we see, and during the exam, we were able to show the patient that their jaw can go to a different place that's behind where they bite habitually. So I tell them that we've examined you, and as you recall, when we ask you to bite, you bite where your teeth fit the best, but your jaw joint is slightly out of socket, and I'll highlight this by focusing on this area, saying the green lines don't line up. And yet I tell them that their jaw does open and rotate and come out of socket, just like with a healthy bite. But as they go back to their bite, and it's a learned behavior to bite where your teeth fit the best, as they go back into their bite, the jaw joint is slightly out of socket. The implications are, when you have a bite like that, that there's another place where the mandible can go to, and it's here. And during the examination, I might remind them that, do you recall how when I allowed your jaw to go to its proper joint position, how there was one back tooth that touched, and then when you bit into, or bit or slid into your normal acquired bite, how your jaw moved forward. And I'll wait for them to respond to that. So again, I'll let them see that and digest that. So I've included some photos in the sequence for you to show you how a, a girl came to me, a woman came to me rather, and w wanted some anterior cosmetic work done, but she was in an edge-to-edge -edge position and was told that she may have to have surgery to pull her lower jaw back so there'd be room to lengthen these teeth, which were quite short. But when we allowed her to go to a centric relation position, she simply slid back to here, and we had all the room in the world for aesthetic dentistry on. And I'll go back to that, just to let you digest that. That's a habitual bite. That's the same gal easily and quickly going into a centric relation position, just holding it uh, during an exam, so I could take a photograph of that. Where you've lost canine guidance, which is a particular problem, a uh, patient now knows that the back teeth shouldn't touch when there's any jaw motion at uh, during night, during nighttime um, grinding activity. I show them uh, if the canines are worn down that this is the process that occurred. The canines wore down over time. Now we've lost those points which help separate the back teeth. Now the back teeth can contact. So the canine is worn down. 
the back teeth can contact and now you're hitting on a back tooth and this could be a, a patient that comes in with a sore loose back tooth and you've quickly identified that that tooth is the only tooth touching uh, during lateral motion again it's an opportunity to discuss the Williamson study to say if back teeth can touch your muscle activity will be increased and I tell them that there can be problems with the the tooth being loose or sore, uh, there can be damage to the bone, and there can be changes in the architecture of the root of the tooth, and uh, that would be the dental abfraction. I let that go back, and I'll back up for your sake, just to show you again that damage to the bone. If you watch up at the top of that bicuspid, you'll see the changes in the bone. And we'll go to the next which shows destructive occlusion. And this is often what we see in clinical practice. And it's a great opportunity to tell the patient, unlike the um, inclines of the teeth that had nowhere, uh, these areas on these back teeth have excessive flat worn areas that shouldn't, shouldn't be in contact. So here's a particularly useful photograph of someone who's worn their canines down. I'll spend a little time showing a patient with that, where that canine is worn down, where the back teeth used to be apart. They're now in contact. And there's some changes here in the tissue, and these teeth were sore and breaking. And then we have a biting surface view of this particular quadrant. And I've added these little dots to again emphasize that the tooth should only contact in the high points and in the low points. So here's the top of the peak of the tooth, and here's the valley area. And we have all this wear here and here and here that shouldn't be there. This is a favorite animation. This shows someone that has a habitual bite with the jaw joint not seated. So during opening, they have those digastric muscles functioning again. The pterygoids pull the jaw joint out of socket so they can open completely. And when they close, the muscles that close the mouth, again, the temporalis and masseter function when they come into their habitual bite, and if they spend time here at night clenching, um, this is what occurs. There's not only activity of the muscles that close the mouth, which, which are the large ones on the left, but those little pterygoid muscles are continuing to fire, and fire in a very hyperactive way. And I'll spend a little bit of time moving this back and forth. So I tell them that the secret to stopping this type of activity, which is causing sore muscles and wear on the teeth, is to allow this jaw joint to go into its proper place. And that could be accomplished with restorative dentistry. It could be accomplished with orthodontics, sometimes surgery. But it can also be accomplished by creating a, an ideal a permissive splint, either a maxillary or a mandibular splint. Um, with built-in anterior guidance to give the patient an immediate uh, experience of having a stable bite for the first time. So here again, hypermuscle activity. And I also will stop and tell them, you know, the reason you feel like you have problems sometimes and not others is because there is an element of stress related to bite problems. If you're in a stressful situation, it's financial worries or, you know, the boss is going sideways on you, uh, often you'll take that to bed at night and if you put your teeth together for a long period of time with a lot of force, you're going to have this type of activity. If you're in, on vacation and you're relaxed and you're sleeping with your mouth open, you had a, you know, a great day on the beach and a glass of wine before you went to dinner, often there's no clenching. So, the, um, the element of stress does uh, bring into play 
why sometimes I have problems and sometimes I don't. And I found that patients really um, perk up when they hear that for the first time. So this is a side-by-side -side animation to show normal muscle activity on the left with a stable bite. And notice that the joint is seated, and I'll often highlight that. And in this case, the jaw is out of socket. So you have normal muscle activity during opening. The pterygoids contract. And during close, closing, everything releases on the left. You come back into your acquired bite. These pterygoid muscles are relaxed. And over here on the right, the muscles are fired up. And with bite effects, we've created some muscular movement to show that hyper muscle activity. It almost makes your headache when you look at it. This is where the fun begins. Because I get to show them why the splint that I make, or the splint that you'll make, is going to solve their problems. And we know that, and we know that every time. So we're going to place this appliance in your mouth and it's going to be very solid and hard. It's going to have a little ramp in the front so it has some of the uh, features of front teeth. And in the back, instead of having a bite, this is just a very flat, hard appliance. This would be your passive splint. Uh, it doesn't direct the bite, it just allows the person to close onto it. And when they close and as it's seated and as they close onto it, Notice what happens to the jaw joint and notice what happens to the pterygoid muscles. So as they close and, and bite on it, there's no place for the jaw to go except up. And there's no place for the jaw to go except up. And the only thing that the pterygoid muscles will do is release. So when a patient wears this type of appliance and they clench at night, the only muscles that are functioning are the muscles that shut their mouth. And I'll go back and spend a little time on that again to tell them and show them how the key is that we're allowing their jaw to go where it's designed to go and to shut these muscles off. So we're not manipulating them, we're not doing anything but asking them to close their mouth on this now perfect substitute bite appliance. So here it is going in place, it's fully seated, as they close, the joint seats, pterygoid muscles relax. And this animation has the details of the splint, which I find effective, because now they know what anterior guidance looks like. Now they know what uh, proper tooth contact looks like. So again, we show the pterygoids are, are fired up. The jaw joint is out of socket in their habitual bite. This is where they spend time closing their mouth and clenching at night. We're going to place the appliance in. It seats. They close on it. The joint seat. Let's look at that again. Place the appliance. It seats. They close on it. The joints seat. The pterygoid muscles relax. And here we're showing just the elevator muscles or mouth closing muscles functioning. I also have an opportunity to show them that this appliance requires proper tooth contact. So what we have are just little li lines in the front and dots in the back. And all teeth hit simultaneously. And finally, if they slide forward, the front teeth in this case, the front of the appliance separates the back teeth. And they close. The joint seats. The pterygoid muscles relax. And if they were to move sideways, we would have just the canines touch, whether they move to the right or to the left. And often I'll just go back and forth and let them see that canine guidance. The net result is we have a happy patient, satisfied patient. At this point I would stop the recording. And if a patient at this point, and what I typically see is 
um, acceptance because I'll ask them uh, if they understand why they have these problems with their teeth and their muscles and I'll ask them what would you like to do about it and be quiet and more often than not they'll say well what's the first step and I'll, in this case I would say I'd like to put you in an appliance and let you experience uh, for yourself what it feels like to have a normal occlusion and of course in the event that there isn't case acceptance um, and then we're able to um, ask the patient if they'd like us to uh, send an email with a summary of our, our discussion today uh, it could be printed um, they would see um, this type of preview I'll just drag this down and this is just a summary of all the uh, animations and photographs that we look, looked at And at that point, well, I'd say we pretty well covered uh, how to create a sequence, uh, giving you some litany on uh, some of the things that I might say. Of course, you're going to say what uh, you're more comfortable with. But um, I think you can go ahead and get started. And thank you for downloading uh, BiteFX, the trial copy. And um, we'd be glad to help in any way we can. Thank you so much for your time.